future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Pierre Lint. This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Solutions, the leading iGaming PAM platform with a modular approach, including many benefits like a fast, secure, and scalable API-based platform integrated with all major third-party products and services. Make sure you head over to Pragmatic Solutions and join our smart thinking. Then I have a first question for you here today as a fellow ice hockey fan. Um, what is, or who rather, is the best hockey player of all time? This is a trick question, by the way. That is a very challenging question. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can go. I am quite biased towards uh, number four, Bobby Orr, uh, due to the fact that my family has roots in Perry Sound and he's from Perry Sound, local legend. So I think for the fact that he totally changed the way that hockey is played, he's my leader currently, but... After seeing Connor Bernard, I don't know, maybe there's a new one emerging. We'll see. <laughs> I was, I was going to say the objectively right answer, of course, as a Swedish person as, and for you as a Toronto fan is, of it's course, Matt. Matt Sundin. <laughs> oh, he does have God. the best backhand ever. Definitely had a discussion about that literally last night about how strong his backhand is. So. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough, you. fair enough. <laughs> All right. Good start to the podcast here today. But uh, Dan, it's great to have you on the podcast here today. You're the Thank CEO you. of uh, Sports Info Solutions, of course. And I want to just kind of kick off this uh, podcast by uh, explaining a little bit uh, more to the listeners of uh, who Sports Info Solutions are, what's your background, and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, certainly. So Sports Info Solutions, we are the literal money ball organization uh, for the listeners. That means we're leveraging data and analytics to help professional sports teams make better decisions on and off the field of play. So the company was actually founded back in 2002, working with the Oakland Athletics. They subsequently made a movie and a, created a, a whole a whole transition towards the leveraging of data within professional sports. So we have a fairly sizable operation working with 23 Major League Baseball teams, seven NBA teams, 12 NFL teams. Each of those are are growing by the day um, and making sure that we're helping those decision makers on and off the field of play make make better decisions through the use of, of data. I joined the business in May of 2021 following an outside investment into the organization. Um, the group was looking to get more into the sports betting space, uh, especially with this rich data that seemed like there were obvious opportunities there. And so obviously my, through my their network and, and knowledge of the industry, we've made use of that uh, by virtue of working with groups like Simple Bet, Star Lizard, anyone that's, that's looking to put an opinion into the, into the market. The leveraging of our data has proven to be quite valuable and useful. Uh, and now we're doing a lot more on the sort of raw data side of things uh, as well, working with a couple of emergent sports properties, uh, working with some odds providers on called custom data sets uh, as well. So we're pretty excited about what 2023 is going to hold. Right, right. So essentially, um, uh, your company uh, uh, produces like rich data uh, through American sports, obviously, which um, in our world and in the, in the online sports betting world, uh, sports books, for example, can leverage this. You mentioned simple bet in real time, I suppose, uh, in order to no. So the majority we, we, we effectively have have two two data products for the sports betting ecosystem. We have our our rich non live data sets, and this is the data right. that is primarily generated for use by professional sports organizations who don't necessarily need data in, okay. in real time. Um, okay. Our data is subsequently leveraged by a group like SimpleBet or, or Anctrum or StarLizard or whomever to yeah. effectively like retrain their models and optimize them based on the events that may have happened on Sunday. So that the next Sunday in an NFL week, yeah. they understand the, the tendencies that are emerging across each individual team, the different formations that are deployed, different strategies, uh, et cetera. We are also now building out live data product, both for uh, emergent sports properties. So groups like the Canadian League Basketball League, we're creating solutions for them. That's inclusive of the raw data, but also the pricing uh, products for that uh, as well. Uh, and then are doing a little bit more on the on the pricing and, and data side where there's basically where there's gaps in the marketplace that are left by the incumbents, the large sport raiders and genius sports. We're very actively having conversations with everyone in and around the industry, trying to be that or customer-centric data provider, effectively. Right, right, fair enough. So essentially, it's a, it's a tool for sports, back to, uh, sports books to uh, be able to offer more accurate uh, odds, essentially. on. Correct. Yeah, on and, and, and certainly if there's um, requirements or gaps that operators have with respect to their settlement data, that's something that we're actively yeah. exploring because we do have a very robust operation and a, a unique differentiator for us relative to the majority of right. data providers anyways is right, right, right. we have... 
a level of sports sports subject matter expertise. Like the leaders of our individual sports and subsequently everyone within our sporting departments, like they come from that sport. Like our our VP of basketball was director of analytics for the Phoenix Suns and knows everything about the NBA and how teams think about basketball and how basketball should, could, and will be played. And so that makes our data collection slightly unique relative to a data journalist that's just out in the field collecting sort of basic data. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So Dan, obviously you yourself, you have a quite interesting background in the uh, sports betting industry and you joined DraftKings in, I believe, like 2015, something 2015, like that? correct, yeah. Right, and this was, this was before PASPA was repealed. That Not before PASPA, yeah. <laughs> paved the way to, uh, to legalize online sports betting in the US. And uh, I'm really curious to know, uh, at that time when you, when you worked at DraftKings, uh, was the plan always to uh, transition from a... Uh, DFS company into a primarily gambling company eventually? Like, did, did DraftKings uh, kind of uh, predict that this was going to happen at some point, or was that never yeah. in the plans? I, mean, I would imagine, without 100% knowing that at some level, certainly within the executive group and, and among the board, there was some level of belief that eventually the tide would turn with respect to the legislation and regulation of sports, sports betting in some capacity in the US. But in and amongst the team at DraftKings in 2015, we were very hyper focused on beating FanDuel with respect to daily fantasy yeah. sports. That was <laughs> that was what was available. I joined at a really interesting time when it was it was just basically after the summer of 2015. And for those who are not in the US, the summer of 2015 is when DraftKings and FanDuel combined to spend about a billion dollars in in advertising. It was very pervasive Crazy. in and around anything yeah. to do with sports. I remember even flying down to Boston for my interview with DraftKings and like you could watch ESPN on the flight. It was nonstop DraftKings on the yeah. baseball tonight or something like that. And so at that time there was heavy, heavy investment into daily fantasy sports. There were a lot of competing companies entering the space and DraftKings and FanDuel were very much the, the leaders at that time. Right. And then shortly thereafter is when all of the controversy, we'll call it hit the, hit the industry, there was a, we got kicked out of New York and, and Nevada. There were very, there were basically no regulations surrounding it in any capacity. It ended up being a blessing in disguise and that we were sort of forced to adopt slightly different technology and structures to how we created the products and go that state by state route, which ended up being very important for the way things, things rolled out in, in the U S. But that, that rocket ship completely halted <laughs> to the point where oh, really? ultimately oh. we ended up trying to merge with FanDuel if you fast forward for two years from there. So it was, it was yeah. really, really fascinating to join when it was like, we're hiring 20 people a week. It's all about explosive growth. And then it's like, oh, whoa, we're, we got to like hold yeah. on for dear life to the point. Like, we can't get bonuses and end up being yeah. good because you'd end up getting equity and whatnot. But yeah, it was a, it was a fascinating period for sure. But, but do you think that would have been a sustainable business model in the long run to only, um, only uh, focus I mean, on the I, I, I product? Think at the time, the way that the competitive landscape was in the U.S. for daily fantasy sports with that many players, it would not have been sustainable, I don't believe, anyways. Um, and I think that's why, ultimately, a bunch of players dropped out. And then, subsequently, DraftKings and FanDuel figured the best way to evolve going forward would be to do it together uh, as well, as opposed to competing with one another, really group ourselves as broader sports entertainment. Because there were sort of adjacent products that were created periodically by by both entities like we had a, a media product and, and FanDuel had done done a little bit more on the the season long side of things as well so there were there were some thoughts there I don't think it's overly dissimilar to how we've seen the evolution of sports betting in the U.S. as well no, no exactly so many, just on a bigger scale as yes well. big big gold rush everyone thinks yep. they can go and and sustainably get some piece of market share and and sort of win the little game that they're trying to win but like Ultimately, there's only so much pie that's available, and I think we're only going to see more consolidation in sports betting, kind of similar to what we saw in, in DFS, uh, right. effectively, where now there's, there's really two players. There's DraftKings and FanDuel. And, I mean, I guess there's like underdog, and there's sort of different variations of DFS that have emerged, your single-player fantasy, which are more like player props, really, your, your prize picks, your underdogs, um, and whatnot. But yeah, to like succinctly answer that question, I, I don't think – if things were to stay in the same sort of format, especially with some states putting together some regulations as well, that that the market necessarily would have would have lasted. Because even like any any international um, expansion attempts were were pretty frivolous and like didn't didn't move the needle um, 
in any real capacity. So it was very like North American centric product, which, which is fine, but it had its limitations for sure. Right, right, right. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years and obviously PASPA gets repealed, which then paves the way for legal online sports betting in the United States. And within DraftKings at that in or around that time, like at what time did the company start preparing itself for making this massive pivot towards uh, yeah. online sports so betting? What, what's really fascinating, it was like quite literally right after the merger with FanDuel was blocked. So in the summer of 2017, the, that merger was blocked and we, like, we had people over in, in Edinburgh at the time and we, there was no expectation that that merger would be blocked within the, within the organization. We were ready to turn the switch and move all, everyone from FanDuel onto the DraftKings platform. We had the whole platform sorted. You could play FanDuel games, you could play DraftKings games. It was going to be kind of really interesting to actually experience. As soon as that was blocked, we're like, all right, what's next? I don't know what we're supposed to do yeah. here. There were rumblings that there were potential that there was the potential for movement within the sports betting legislation and that PASPA eventually would get repealed. So effectively, we created a very small task force to start looking at sports betting. And I was fortunate to be one of the few people within the organization that had any experience in sports betting prior, uh, prior to joining DraftKings. Like I worked in BC Lottery Corporation for, for a few years running the sports book there and in the UK uh, as well. So there's myself and Jeffrey Haas who, sort of had worked yeah. in gambling in some yeah. capacity anyways. And then, <laughs> and then a bunch of others that obviously were really strong in technology and product and, and whatnot as well. So our, our initial intention, oddly enough, you know, in, in hindsight anyways, was we were intending to launch a sports book in the UK for the Super Bowl of 2018 to learn what is it like to run a sports book. Yeah. We didn't yeah. really have any, any <laughs> real knowledge of that. Obviously things accelerated tremendously and so we we really quickly pivoted right around the say december of 2017 started putting together the pieces to create a team to then subsequently build the sportsbook product for for the u.s in conjunction with our our partner canby who had, we had selected probably right. in like november of, of 2017 so we were pretty pre prepared and like by the time paspa was actually repealed i think it was may 14th of 2018 like that was just that was just a checkbox milestone on the it list. was expected. Yeah. Oh, it was to totally expected at that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, for sure. So we were, we were pretty ready to rock. And obviously like the, the output of that was we launched on August 1st. So not, not very long after Paspo was repealed and we were solo in market in New Jersey for, for three weeks, which was like actually really shocking at the time. Um, but, but really great. Right. 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 I mean, it, it must have been a, in insane period of uh, your career to work in a company that goes through with such a huge pivot because uh, there's so many things that happen in such a short time obviously the company yeah. pivots from one industry to another and then obviously um, you know the, uh, the the acquisition uh, of sp tech uh, going public at the same time you know explosive growth like insane injection of capital then COVID happens and <laughs> you know everything crashes and then it like reappears I mean, it must have been a pretty turbulent time at the same time. I, I would yeah, imagine. I mean, it was definitely a whirlwind. I love the fast pace, sort of unknown of launching a new vertical as well. And like, yeah. there's a there's basically a core team at DraftKings still that whenever there's something new to be launched, like they set this one team onto that and they go and execute against that that new opportunity. Yeah. So like, even within DraftKings, it wasn't necessarily a a full pivot of the organization. It was more, we're going to add additional resource and, you know, move some people over here um, to go and create this additional product for sports betting. And then it's okay, actually we should also do casino. And then now there's, there's NFTs and there's additional products that I'm sure that are right, being built yeah. in the background as well, but pretty wild to see like literally 20 new people emerge yeah. inside the company every single week. Like we went, <laughs> yeah. we were, say 200 people when I joined in 2015, it was pretty static until that mid 2017 period. By the time I left, it was 4,000 people. So you can imagine that's a lot of yeah, growth yeah. in a relatively <laughs> short period of time. Um, you need a good HR manager, yeah. that's for sure. That's yeah, for sure. And, you know, super excited. And, and in general, like the ambitions there are very high and to sort yeah. of to win um, within the broader sports entertainment space. And so... You know, yeah, it created a lot of excitement. It brought a lot of you know really talented individuals to the to the teams as well, and uh, yeah, super motivating for sure. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, to linger on this uh, a little bit more, I have a, a question on on. Um, obviously, you were the um, director of sportsbook at the time, and and um, some 
trend that emerged in the US that us European had not uh, seen before is this concept of vertical integration. Mm -hmm. And um, Graph Games, you obviously spearheaded that trend by acquiring SB Tech um, uh, to, uh, to, to basically take the sport sport with in-house and obviously other operators followed uh, to do the same after that uh, um, as well. Um, news emerged just uh, yesterday actually that um, Fanatics who are about to launch their own sportsbook yep. uh, they signed a deal with Amalco um, so an external uh, third-party sportsbook and they are kind of taking the other approach to uh, rather than integrating for now anyways, uh, ver yeah. vertically <laughs> for now at least yeah who knows what's going to happen down the line of course um, but I'm curious to kind of, um, now that we are a few years into this venture, uh, where operators, uh, some, some major operators are integrating vertically, uh, on the sports betting side. Um, do you feel, still feel like after this is done and dusted now that the uh, kind of vertical integration strategy is the way to go for a tier one operator in the U S or yeah, I, I think so. Vertical? I mean, our, our general strategy and. We took a lot of inspiration from Bet365, I mean, global market leader. It's still somewhat baffling that they haven't done as much in the US as maybe yeah. would have been anticipated. Like They were by far the group that we were most concerned about going into the market. Obviously, like FanDuel has emerged as a major, major player and a clear market leader at this point. But we really thought that the way that they went about things at Bet365 was, was the optimal path. And so even initially in our selection of, of Cambi as our initial vendor to go to market from a, from a trading and, and platform side of things as well. They really emerged as the only group that we could go with because we knew that ultimately we were going to build or buy the rest of the, the platform to quote unquote own our own destiny. I think in general, with the ambitions that a, a company like a DraftKings has, that's hypercritical. And we sort of saw that play out over the course of time as well. And Cambi was a great great supplier. Like if you're going to launch a new sports betting product anywhere, like I would highly advocate for, yeah. for them. They did an incredible I'm, I'm surprised job. you didn't acquire a company. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it was, it was debated. Um, ultimately went a different <laughs> way, but, but, yeah. but yeah, there were, there were periods of time where it was just, it was a struggle to, to not have the ability to change the roadmap based on your specific priorities. And like a notable example of that was, I think at DraftKings, we probably went like a year without same game parlays when FanDuel had it. And like that was on the roadmap from the start of our, yeah. Huge. Uh, of our relationship with Canby, but it was just not prioritized because for whatever reason, there were other things that were going on. Obviously, they have a number of different, different clients as well. So to the extent that you want to like win the market and, and you do have the technical chops and operational know how or have the ability to at least acquire that in an appropriate manner. Then I do think the vertical integration is is the way to go. But I think a few groups probably went a little overboard there, where it's outside of their core competencies, like a, a Bally's, as an example, scooped up a huge number of different entities, and like in their shoes, maybe that's not the the right approach necessarily. Um, so yeah, it will be very interesting to see if for, for fanatics for sure. How does this? Yeah. How does this go? You know, they're they're certainly. From, from my understanding, anyways, they're going to own a lot of the core competencies around the platform and, and the, the data personalization side of things and obviously the experience and then plug in Melco and probably best in class, um, third party feeds, which is, which is a fine, fine approach to get to market. Sort of knowing, knowing how high the bar is right now, if you really ultimately want to compete, um, yeah, yeah. as well. So, yeah. That's that's one of the uh, so we are at the beginning of the year at the time of this recording, of course, and uh, it's always fun to make predictions. And um, I'm reading uh, Ailes and Kirkus; they made a prediction that right. 2023 will be the year of Bet365 Bet in in the US, for example. That's like one of the predictions of them. But I also uh, was uh, reading another prediction, which is that you know there's this uh, assumption that Fanatics will go to market and become one of the uh, kind of market. Uh, leaders in the states that they enter but um one prediction was actually that the fanatics will just crash and burn because uh the uh, the market is so ahead now and kind of marketing competence uh, you know acquiring players and so on and yeah. so forth and it's not as easy as just uh, activating a database from one day to the other w what do you think if you would be making a prediction where, the, where will fanatics land in all of this yeah it's super interesting i mean i think <laughs> the i wouldn't give very many groups any type of opportunity or chance to to break into the into the top whatever the top tier, so the top three or four right. of the sports betting marketplace, they would be basically them and in ESPN are the two brands to me, and subsequently two two databases as well that have at least 
an opportunity to, if they can create a differentiated experience that like truly makes it easier, more interesting and entertaining to go and place wagers and, and have all of the call it table stakes experiences sort of like they have a very good deposit and registration and, and all of that verification experience. They have the full suite of betting opportunities that you would want. You can do your same game parlays, but then they have those additional added elements of leveraging a, their, their large database. So if they can create, I don't know if it's like social products, but they can create some sort of experience that leverages that along with the knowledge that like, I buy a lot of Canada soccer and Toronto Maple Leaf stuff. So maybe you can create some sort of promotions that are specific to that for me, that that's compelling to me in some capacity anyways. And if they can leverage some of the other verticals and data that they have as well to, to make that experience really differentiated. Cause obviously like personalization in general has been an area within sports betting. That's, that's never really hit. Like I could go to any sports book today that I wager on and like, I'll get the same experience that anybody else will get. Or it certainly feels like that anyhow, even though my my behaviors come out of time. my behaviors are pretty consistent. Like I'm coming in and betting on pretty much the I'm a I'm a bit of a homer homer gambler for sure. So I'm coming in and yeah, doing yeah. the same thing. Like, why not just make that easier for me and like even like boost the odds for me periodically? Cause these are like stupid yeah. bets that I'm making anyways. And so to the extent that they can leverage their database and the fact that they're coming to market later than everyone else, so they have the knowledge of what's working to an extent anyways, what's working, what's not working. They can adapt and evolve their strategy accordingly because obviously it's harder to, it's harder to iterate on an existing product versus, you know, create new experiences for something totally new. But, but yeah, they're coming in pretty late. They're going to have to spend a bunch of money. They have capital. So to the extent that they're willing to expend that, then, then you give them a shot, but I don't think they're going to like win and, and beat Fandle and DraftKings by the end of this year. And uh-huh. certainly like scooping up the state licenses and all that's going to be a pretty critical piece, but they got a great team. Um, they certainly uh, assembled a really solid group. They have incredible technology. They're evidently competitive. Um, so I give them a shot, but I don't think yeah. it's going to be a big bang if anyone's expecting that for sure. All right, fair enough. It'll be interesting. So you mentioned, I mean, two names here, ESPN and uh, Fanatics, but uh, to, to kind of, they have the opportunity to break into the tier one operators. But um, does that mean Bet365, even if they would uh, kind of switch on the US strategy, you you think they're going to have a difficult time? They're just too small? I the, mean, I assume... Or, or not known? I assume there's a reason why they haven't gone as fast as maybe would have been anticipated. Um, and I don't know if that's because they saw how much people were spending. We're like, this is not going to be worth it for us. I mean, they have still the best product. I don't, I don't think you can necessarily question that. It's an incredible experience. Um, they've continued to iterate on it. I've certainly noticed it quite a bit. I mean, they're a market leader up here in, in Toronto and Canada, uh, even in the newly regulated market. I assume I haven't, I haven't seen the latest market share numbers if they come out, but you know, they're, they're certainly a, a leader here. And so from a product perspective, they can really do some damage, but they're going to have to spend a lot of money to create that brand resonance. And that's where what would be really intriguing, I think would be if they were to do something with an ESPN, that's like kind of trying to figure out how they enter the ecosystem accordingly or not enter, but like really double down into the space. Obviously there's the rumors with DraftKings as well with ESPN too. So maybe that's, that's a no op, but yeah, I think they need to get creative to create the brand resonance or spend a lot of money if they really want to sort of break into the yeah. mold. Cause the, the, the general formula that's been successful thus far is table stakes, technology and products, like a good, good product, large database, spending money. That's sort of, yeah. that's sort of it. And GM has <laughs> done that. DraftKings has done that. Fandle has done that to a, to a lesser extent. Caesars has done that as well. And those are, yeah. those are your clear top four. But but at some yeah. point this bond has the spend has to come down on, well, on again, the market the front essentially right is, isn't that then a good opportunity for a uh, bet three six five to enter the market when sure. the spend does decrease and I know that's part of the strategy for fanatics as well they've been pretty yeah. vocal about it. it's like we're not going to rush this because we're not going to just go in and burn money and it's kind of interesting even from the time say whatever eight months ago when it was like okay fanat bet fanatics I think they're called is going to launch at some point in say Q one of twenty twenty three. There's, there's been what five operators drop out of the market, six yep. operators, something like that. There's been a lot of uh, exits already, which presumably brings down the 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 likely spend from a marketing perspective, at least in some capacity. Anyway, so like that that's going to continue to go down with the pressures that are on the the DraftKings and and to an extent the FanDuel's as well to to be efficient with their spend and maybe don't do these these huge 
league level marketing deals that are costing so much that don't necessarily have an easy to quantify ROI. Yeah, it will create opportunities yeah. for for those those differing brands and and that sort of new wave, which I'm actually intrigued about. That new wave of of operator that's coming in with a, a different product experience. Your your mojos, your your betters, um, yeah. your sport trades. Like those are new products, new innovative products coming to the market that at least are different than DraftKings and FanDuel and, and everyone else. So you know you may get, not get the full market share or wallet share from a customer, but you at least get them on your platform doing something that's a little bit unique. Right, right, right. Something different, uh, essentially. Uh, I mean, Dan, um, you you uh, you left uh, DraftKings in 2021, I believe, right? To yeah. uh, to uh, take the uh, CEO position of Sports Info Solutions, and uh, since then, you know, looking at the share price here at DraftKings, um, they are down something like 80 percent uh, on the market. So you can call that the uh, the uh, Dan Hannigan Daily effect. Uh, <laughs> something perhaps. like that. Um, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> something <that's> like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so obviously, um, investors have kind of you know lost faith in the um, in this like hugely profitable opportunity as they saw it in 2020, mm -hmm. 2021. Um, do you believe investors uh, kind of overestimated the uh, opportunity at that time? Or do you feel that uh, perhaps it is the opposite that they are actually, that uh, things are actually progressing towards where the industry yeah, is looking to it's be? A, it's a great question. I mean, I think in general, there was a lot of, um, the way that investors in general were thinking about market opportunities, not just within sports betting, but broadly were, were quite different then to now. There was hyper-focus on top line, top line, top line, less on, on profitability. And that enabled a little bit of bloat to emerge for sure within, within each of those, those organizations. But, you know, succinctly thinking about a DraftKings and their continued market opportunity, like I think now there's a little bit of underestimating going on because like the numbers are still to my understanding anyways quite quite strong there's there's additional products that will emerge that will leverage that customer spend and that database that's you know they've worked pretty hard it's not easy to create a a database of qualified gamblers that's 20 million strong like that's not an easy easy task so you know to the extent that they add additional horse racing or poker or lottery or, or whatever other products that may enable the extent of that customer's wallet into those into those uh, those verticals as well, kind of like going from DFS to sportsbook to to casino to to NFTs. Like I think there's still a a unique opportunity there because of how strong the brand is. It, it definitely resonates with the demographic that that you're looking for um, from a product and technology perspective. They've generally been been quite strong, similar to, similar to FanDuel and, and potentially how Fanatics is, is thinking about things uh, as well. Should it have been at seventy dollars in twenty twenty one? Probably not. You know, maybe maybe people were a little excited, and I mean, just look at the stock market in general at that time. Things were were just crazy, absolute crazy. Um, right. Should it be at eleven dollars or whatever it is today? I think that's a. I think there's. I think there's more there for sure. Um, how far they get? I, there's a lot of, I think, internal cleanup probably that needs to to go on to make sure that the focus is on profitability and doing things efficiently and making sure that that spend to acquire customers, which is going to continue to be necessary, is done in the most efficient way possible, especially now that the brand is at that level that it doesn't necessarily need the deal with whatever, the NFL. I'm not saying that they won't partner with the NFL in perpetuity, they may, no. but um, I think that sort of knowledge and trust of the brand and, and the fact that customers believe that their money is generally secure there, notwithstanding some of the issues they've had recently, um, I think that will enable some some differing ways of deploying capital in the future. Exactly. Yeah, they, it's so difficult, right, to uh, understand where DraftKings should be, like where the where the yeah. um, share price should be at this stage, because you know it's a five billion uh, dollar market cap currently at eleven dollars per share, and so uh, you know essentially that means that um, investors are expecting them to make something like half a billion dollar EBITDA a year eventually yeah. or something like that in order to justify the the market cap and just um, to compare that that is kind of like a similar level to uh, entain for example which is right. obviously a global uh, brand so the question is then eventually will the american market in its own right be able to um, sustain those type of ebitas uh, in the in the future but but it could also be that uh, DraftKings, i suppose uh, are looking to expand outside of the us at some point as well sure. um yeah and was, the, yeah. i mean there's a lot of yeah. unknowns really hard to price of course, just around 
how are the additional states going to roll out? I think things have been a little bit slower there, especially on the iGaming side. That that rollout has been way way slower than, right. than initially anticipated. And like, yeah. you know, for for a company like a DraftKings, that's almost doubling your revenue in a given state just by virtue of turning that on. Like it's an easy, not easy, but it's a it's a yeah. it's a cross sell that works and is efficient. And you've done the hard work of acquiring customers into your sports betting product, and if the experience is seamless to, to convert over. Yeah, you, know, you see the numbers in in the various states. Like they're pretty strong, without a huge amount of focus. Like there's not a lot of advertising of the casino products specifically. So, yeah. I think that's going to be a really critical factor going forward for sure. And I, my my belief is that from a from a narrative perspective and a lobbying perspective, there's going to be more focus there uh, in 2023 than maybe we've seen in the past. There was a little bit of it late 2022, but I think that's going to be there's going to be a bigger push there um, for sure. Right, right. Makes sense. Uh, so Dan, speaking of investment, uh, I mean, you're, you're a seed investor yourself, which must have been an interesting journey in, For sure. in, in 2022 and onwards. Uh, what, are, what are some of the investments that you've made and uh, what, what's kind of your investment philosophy? What, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, is- in general, I like to invest in opportunities where, A, like specifically, I think I can add some value to the, to the group through my network, through my experience, through product recommendations, whatever it might be. Um, so that's like hyper important to me in general within any of the investments that I make. Obviously team is, is hyper critical as well, especially like I'm generally doing very earlier stage. So to the extent that they might not even have a, a full product or, or only like a beta or an alpha version of it uh, as well, like believing in the team that's there is, is really, really important obviously the, the industry that they're playing in. Uh, I, yeah. I tend to like stick within the, the sporting realm in general anyway. So I understand the opportunities that might exist, some of the challenges that might exist um, as well. And, and yeah, if there's a unique opportunity where I believe there's some value that can be created through the investment and, and sort of expanded upon through how I can inject myself to, to aid that organization as well, I'll do that. Like, I haven't done, done too many and I don't intend to go and, yeah. splash money around 10 different companies this year by any means. But um, yeah, to the extent that I can be useful and, and drive some value and it's an interesting opportunity and group that's thinking about things a little bit differently, I'll take a swing. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and uh, I mean, also I saw that you are kind of dabbling in the Web3 world a little bit as well. And, and um, what do you think? I mean, there was a lot of talk, especially in 2021, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the confluence, uh, the, the intersection mm-hmm. between kind of online sports betting, online gambling, and Web3 overall, we saw companies emerging like Betdex, for example, right. uh, you know, the decentralized sports betting, uh, so on and so forth. But, but what do you make of this now that, you know, we are kind of entering a crypto winter, um, the talk around the like, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yes. And the, the talk around, um, you know, Web3 uh, future and the metaverse in general has kind of cooled off mm-hmm. uh, quite a bit of course yeah I mean, I, but, uh, I, so we can see it more from like um you know more sober eyes at this time right, like right. What, what do you think now at, uh, at this stage I, I, still, Where I, like? have, I have strong belief in like in the underlying technology is fascinating and right. there are applications undoubtedly there was a crazy rush of products and groups that were created that didn't add appropriate value and and a lot of them don't even necessarily leverage the technology in the right way, but have the buzzwords. And so it felt like it was web three, even if it, even if it maybe wasn't. Um, so yeah. I think there's a lot of interesting applications, certainly within sports betting, but broadly with just within sports and sports entertainment is where I think there's, there's going to be the most, like if you look at areas like ticketing, I think there's obvious opportunities there to leverage this type of technology to create, to create more value. I've been a big fan of, what like a so rare or the the rainmakers that DraftKings has created as well, like the leveraging of these assets, these cards effectively for and creating utility. I think the, like having the utility is incredibly important. Where it was right. always the case with some of the projects that have emerged. Um, I, I definitely think there's going to be more there, and you know, within the the crypto enter, it seems like the general narrative is any of those groups that entered the market seeing the the gold, but not necessarily caring what kind of bodies were left in your wake as you went through it, they're all going to fall off. And and as we emerge in say early 2024, there's going to be a few, a few really strong products and groups that are actually adding considerable value with really interesting technology that, you know, presumably will be able to scale into, into new opportunities. So. 
Right, right. Are there any other kind of underlying trends that you see in the sports betting, online sports betting world in, on the American side that uh, perhaps uh, yeah, you see I mean, as interesting now as we go into 2023? Not, not totally shocking, I suppose, for those that have experienced what's gone on in, in, the, in the UK and Europe. But like Same game parlays, live betting micro, micro markets, all of those are emerging as really, really critical parts of of the experience. And if you go to any of the top tier operators products today, like they're, they're pretty front and center now. I think there's still, there's still more to be done. And especially on the live betting side, that was a big part of the sort of thesis behind me leaving a company like DraftKings and going to a sports info solutions, a sports data company, because it always felt like on the data side specifically, that was holding things back within, within live betting for the U S sports Specifically, and obviously, like, yeah, there weren't necessarily the same investments into the models the way that they had been invested in for soccer and tennis, and so you had a really good soccer live soccer experience or live tennis experience. Whereas college football, specifically, like you'd be lucky if forty percent of the game, sorry, if sixty percent of the game, you'd be able to even try to place a wager. And then when you did try to place that right. wager, the bet delays seven seconds, eight seconds, ten seconds, so it's getting getting rejected twenty five, thirty percent of the time, and that was just a a really, really poor experience. And so, right. you know, to the extent that it's possible, that's part of what we're uh, endeavoring to do here at SIS is, is help either help improve the models through our training data or fill in gaps from a data perspective as well. And almost like supply custom data to the big players who have very specific needs for what the data should look like. Cause that wasn't, that's just not part of the, the business model for, for the incumbents uh, in the space. So if anyone's looking for live data, that helps them yeah. keep markets open for longer and create that sort of frictionless experience. Yeah, we're all yours. So let's go. <laughs> Amazing. So, so final question for you today, Landon. Like, what what's, uh, what comes next now for uh, Sports Info Solutions? What's uh, what's your focus right now? Uh, what, what's what's in the cards now for twenty twenty three? Yeah, uh, I mean, two two big focuses are working to inject ourselves further into the sports betting space through live data. So we have a couple of really interesting initiatives which we're hoping to announce. Probably late Q1 might be a little bit, a little bit after that, but there will be some pretty interesting um, partnerships that we're creating there and some new product that we're that we're super excited about. And then on our team analytics side side of things, we've invested quite a bit into our uh, our general analytics platform, which um, we believe will be a bit of a game changer, especially in the NBA as we're working with some of the uh, some of the league partners there. So we're we're pretty excited about those two those two initiatives. And what's fascinating about it is that each of those will be able to add to one another uh, as, as well, which is not really something that's been seen a huge amount necessarily within the, the sports betting ecosystem today. So that's going to be really interesting to see how it all evolves for us. Amazing, Dan. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And obviously, we are both a little bit under the weather here today. So thank you again for uh, still taking your time and, and sharing your interesting knowledge with me today. I really appreciate that. Thank Happy you. to. Thank you very much as well.